Shane, Limerick are in their first uh, consecutive All-Ireland final since 1974, but I think everybody is talking today about Cork, Corkness, the Rebels, they're back. A cracker against Kilkenny yesterday. There's Kieran Kingston showing a bit of Corkness. 137 to 132. You know, there's a lot to go into about them getting the job done and not getting the job done and so on and so forth. But in general, Cork showed the kind of potential that we were waiting to see from them for a long time today, uh, yesterday, didn't they? Yeah. I was reading Dermot Sullivan's interview straight after the match and uh, as you said about that Corkness and you know if there's ever a county that will always believe in themselves no matter how many times they've been down it's definitely Cork you know having won a Ireland in 16 years but I love that I love the self-confidence they have yeah. I love the People's Republic thing you know they're doing everything good in sport in, in the country at the moment uh, was it up to last week they had 25 championship ma matches played between minor under 20 hurling and football and senior hurling and they'd won 23 out of 25 so they're on a crest of a wave, then the two boys bring back the gold medals as well down to Skibbereen. And, you know, they're on about making Skibbereen maybe a country on its own now. They've won so many Olympic medals. So I just, you know, and just to go back to Daniel Sullivan's interview, and he just said, look, everybody has Limerick's name etched in on Lee McCarthy already. Like, and I think that's going to be massive motivation for him for the next couple of weeks. And that we're all saying it like that, you know, and rightly so. Like, this is the greatest Limerick hurling team ever and, and mm -hmm. one of the greatest hurling teams in modern era because of what they've done consistently since since 2018 you know uh three monster finals two national leagues they're in uh as you said two all-ireland titles won and in, in another all-ireland final in, in a couple of weeks time but i just think and dear Sullivan mentioned it as well and I, I maybe you do maybe you agree as well mick i just think there's a difference in this cork group even even last year inside the gaelic grounds they uh, if you remember that day the weather was brutal against tipperary um in the championship and um, and they went two points up and they had an absolute storm behind them. And everyone thought, sure, this is it. They're going to kick on here now. They're going to be, yeah. tip. you know, they're finally they're going to get one over on tip. And, you know, tip went up the field, got a score. Jake Morris got a goal. And, and, and that's it. People are always saying, look, there's Cork again now. And it was put up to them. They didn't, they didn't show anything. But this year, I think it's been a different group. And there's a different mentality. There's a different kind of a steelness in the group in that. If you remember against Clare, when Jim Ryan scored a point, put Clare point up. What do Cork do? They respond by scoring the next 1-5 to a point. They'll score clear 1-5 to a point up to, you know, um, injury time. Against Dublin the last day, Dublin kicked off three or four points. How did Cork react? They didn't fall away. They scored the next five points in a row. And I think yesterday, Tim O'Mahony, he, he epitomised everything that's good with Cork this year in the mistake he made for the goal. We've all seen it. You know, it's easy to say he was kind of casual coming out with the ball. Lost the ball. Podrick Walsh, Joe Canning-esque pass to... Yeah into Adrian Mullen, who buries the ball. What a goal. But Tim O'Mahony comes out and has an absolute worldly of a game in, in the extra time. I think in the first, the first two or three puckouts he caught him himself, I think he actually I think he actually won five of the Kilkenny puckouts on his own. And I'd say when the rest of them looked at him and the way he reacted, and I'm sure they had a great chat, Mick, in the dressing room before they came out for extra time to say, look, this is it now, lads. This, this is our time to show everyone that, you know, we're not that 2018 team that fell away against Limerick. We're not that team that fell away against even Tip last year. We're a different group. And I think they are. And I think there's a great steelness in the group. And uh, that's that's in the management. That's in everyone who uh, who had a cork top on them in, in Crow Park yesterday. Yeah. That's why it was a mistake. You're obviously right. But I just watched it from a different angle on the Sunday game when they were doing the analysis. And there was two things that stood out to me. And one was that I think... It, I don't think it was a plan to run out with the ball as I, I, I thought, you know, maybe his head wasn't in it. But whatever way it fell on his left and the angle he was at, I actually thought that he, he kind of... He changed his mind last night. Maybe he thought that he was going to be hooked or blocked or something like that and just had to run with it. And then you're kind of in no man's land then when you're kind of ended up running and he's trying to bounce it and everything like that. But And then there's the other the other part of that angle you see is that when he's on his knees looking behind him, waiting to see how it's going to end up and putting the head into the ground. And I think that is a huge mark of character that he dominated extra time then because the last thing he did in normal time was have his head in the ground thinking, I'm after doing this to us. You know, it's, it, it is interesting. Oh, yeah. Mm. How do we and like you look yeah. and look at the composure Coleman had? You know, massive dropping ball coming in, caught it. I thought he did his best game for Cork yesterday, in my opinion. The amount of ball he got on, mm. but yeah, look, I mean, we've all it's, it's easy sitting at home or sitting to stand and watching doing. I'm sure they were absolutely to use a Cork word flat at that stage, like as well. You know, the mind isn't going because the, yeah. the the body is so tired that the mind is trying to play catch up with it too. But look, I mean, as I said, the way they responded is 
sign of a sign of a great group, sign of a very mentally strong group as well, Mick. Yeah. Now they were caught in a very similar way against Clare in the last second, and it would have cost them their place in the championship because they were only two points up at that stage. Um, I was wonder, will it be a concern? I don't know if that's maybe even maybe that's a conversation for later on when we're talking about the final or we're talking about Cork, but. Uh, you know how they're going to get on against Limerick, but just even in back into this match, there was a kind of an unbelievable sense of occasion yesterday. I think set up by um, set up by Kelly Harrington, really. You know, and the the proximity of Fort La Road to Crow Park. You will have seen the pictures. Everybody will have seen them there. Uh, you can see them on your screen if you're watching, um, as opposed to listening of uh, the fans coming in. I don't know how much the Harringtons will have actually loved that as much as they'll say they did. But I felt like I was actually in around the area earlier on yesterday morning, and it was like it felt like a Crow Park day. You know, and I don't know yeah. if you've seen that. You were there on Saturday. I don't know if it was even quite like that, but it felt a little bit more like. Jesus, we're not too far off real All Ireland semi final days. And I wonder, is there something in the definitely in Kilkenny, but in the Cork psyche as well, that both teams kind of played up to that a little bit? And it, it, it might have given us the sort of feeling of the classic that we had yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just think the pictures going around, Mick, are absolutely brilliant. Uh, there's a picture going around of one of the Kilkenny lads, one of the Kilkenny, I think, from Moonkind. I think the man is from. Yeah. He, he brings a, a, a bag of spuds like. I mean, like, what what other country is that going on in that someone from a completely different sport arrives on and how do you say congratulations? Here's a bag. Here's a bag of potatoes. You know, have have a nice dinner today. And I just think that shows that the world is a small place, Mick, but Ireland yeah. is only a big parish. Like, I mean, yeah. we all know we all know someone from another county, or we're nearly all related in, in some form of another. But for someone from the GA world to feel that you know, this it's okay for me to go up to an Olympic champion, like. Someone who's recognised on the worldwide stage now as being one of the best female boxers in the world, and and I'll bring her a bag of spuds, like, and you know, people are just going up getting, people are just up getting pictures taken and everything. And as you said, like the Harrington's, they, they must be wrecked, like they were probably up since four o'clock yesterday morning getting ready for the fighter, you know, because they couldn't sleep the night before. But and I'm sure Kelly, like, I think she left her phone down and seeing images of her looking at things that were going on on Jackie Hurley's phone and. I'm sure she'll be blown away by it all as well. She spent her life looking out the window at people going to matches in Crow Park, as you said, a yeah. stone throw away. And I'd say, do you know what? They could charge what they want now for anyone to park outside the house from now on for matches <laughs> in Crow Park anyway. Everyone will want to park up along Portland Road, but absolutely brilliant. I tell you, Mick, we like you talk about things and the novelty of things. We had some job getting to Crow Park Saturday. I mean, I oh, never yeah. seen as much hassle with bales of hay. I mean, the last time there was much hassle over bale of hay, I'd say, was on uh, Glen Row when uh, was it Miley and Tadelma were rolling around in one. But uh, other than that, it was just chaos going up the road there. Four and a half hours it took us to get up, you know. And uh, it was just, it was just, it's just a crazy weekend with the hurling and with the Olympics and everything. But uh, I think what the main thing is that what connected the whole lot was sport, like, and I think mm. sport is brilliant. And I, I just. As a teacher, I just hope that that kids just take up some sport after the summer wrap we're having between the Euros, the Olympics, the hurling, the football, the ladies' football, the camogie. We've been spoiled for choice this summer. So I just hope that that's that's the main thing that comes over really that, that kids just say, look, there's lots of sports there I can play and that they'll take up some form of sport. Like, but yeah, you know, it's going to be it's, it's going to be a great couple of weeks. To go back to the Cork thing there. I just feel Cork bring an excitement and a color to. Um, yeah. A big day that very few other counties do. Ask anybody in Turles when Cork are playing in Turles, like the crack you'll have in the pubs or on the streets after with the Cork crowd, and they're getting the train back down, and they're just, you know, no matter what happened in the match, you just love that Corkness about them. Like you know, they're so witty, they're so funny, and as I said, the color that they bring to it, and all real passionate sports people as well. Like you know, and you know, they love, they just love their sport down there, and they're so good at so many of them that, you know. It's, it's great to see him back in the final. I'd say going through the teams, Mick, I'd say in your own Clare there in 2013 to play Cork, I'd say Pat Horgan and Shami Harnady are the only two survivors from that. So, you know, you're looking at a completely a completely different panel, you know, coming in to try and get prepped for an all Ireland final. And that'll be, you know, that'll be that'll be difficult as well, you know, organised yeah. suits, where are you going to go, where are we going to go afterwards, where the Limerick lads are used to that now for the last few years. So, look, they're all factors to take into account but i'm sure the cork lads are delighted to be able to take them into account you mentioned the core color and what they bring to games and everything like that I remember like the the 2017 monster final going in there as a Clare fan into the um 
Klein and end and thinking, Jesus Christ, are we at the wrong match? Did we get the wrong day? And it was like it was ninety percent. If it, if it was ninety minimum percent Cork that day, and I remember even being embarrassed as a Clare fan like that. It was so so Cork, but that was almost the return of that showed you the appetite that was there for the, this team and getting behind this team that was there. And they had those two years, and they weren't far off in eighteen, and it just sort of petered away. You mentioned what they did last year, the year before. Six of the starters from the 2018 semi final play started on Sunday. There is more involved, you know, like obviously Shane Kingston, should he have been starting, you know what I mean? He's one of them. Mm-hmm. But six starters isn't a lot for a three year turnover for a team that were very, very, very close to making it all out of the final, one of the classic semi finals of all time. Yeah, it, oh no, I, I absolutely. Uh, sorry, Mick, but like I think the difference in 2018 is that. You remember 2018, like we were like, you know, we were anyone that was lucky to be, enough to be there. What did Cork have to do that day? Like they had to bring back on Jamie Harnady. I think they had to, had to bring back on Daniel Kearney, you know, and everyone says that Limerick blew him away an extra time. They did blow him away an extra time, but I mean, Limerick brought on some serious subs that day. Shane Dowling came on, Pat Ryan came on. Like, I mean, their bench was awesome. And now what we're seeing with Cork is like, we're seeing, like at, you said, there were six lads that started, right? You take Alan, Alan Cadigan would have started in 18 and be yeah. one of their main go-to guys. Now he's coming on, you know, because he's who's he been replaced by? Jack O'Connor, who's absolutely lighting it up. And like the point I'm trying to make here, Cork have a group now that, that mm. can play. Whereas, you know, that was very evident to see the last time in 2018 when it do, did go to extra time. They, they didn't have a group or else the management didn't really trust the lads who were behind them sitting on the bench. Whereas now they do. You take it just yesterday alone. Cork's bench scored 11 points from play, right? Shane Kingston scored seven. Um, Alan Cadding comes on and scores three, and Decky Dalton scores a, a monster of a point from out the field. Whereas Kilkenny's bench came on and scored one point, and that yeah. that was massive for Cork, and it's massive for Cork going into the final, knowing that. And we're always we said it here before a few times on the pod, Mick, you know about starters and finishers, and that's the way it's gone. And maybe Cork want to finish with their best team the next day. Maybe they don't want to start with their next team, and that for me is an argument to keep Shane Kingston, keep Alan Cadigan in reserve. You know, it was a big day for Shane Barrett yesterday. He would have learned an awful lot starting his first All-Ireland senior semi-final up there. You know, he would have got great experience from that. Everything didn't go his way, but again, great experience. But for me, the argument to keep those guys in reserve, and if you're a Limerick player and you're looking out to the sideline and you see Alan Cadigan, Shane Kingston getting ready to come on, you know, it can put a little bit of doubt in your mind mm-hmm. that, geez, these lads are burning up at the moment. You know, the thing is starting to open up. We'll need to cut off space a bit more. So, you know, it's obviously, it's a, it's a difficult decision for Kieran Kingston and his management team to make, you know, especially Kieran Kingston, you're sitting around the table looking across from him for breakfast for the next two weeks, like, and, can I and ask he's on the other that? side asking, why aren't you playing him, like, you know? <laughs> I know, but can I ask you that? That's such a GA thing, and I was talking about it at home yesterday, and I said, I must ask Shane about this, because I don't know if you've any experience of it, but, but like, most people do somewhere in their in their career, be it from, like, under fives all the way up to senior county for Shane Kingston, but, like, GA coach parents are notoriously harder on their own children than they are on the rest of the team. Like, and it's not, I wonder who are the only sport that are like that as well. Like, but I don't know. It, it is an awkward enough conversation, but there's, a, I felt before yesterday, I was like, Shane Kingston is bearing the brunt of something that Kieran didn't like in the, in the forwards last week. There was nothing to do necessarily with Shane. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, you see him coming on and doing what he does. And you're thinking, Jesus, like, that's exactly what a team needs is that type of player when every when the defenders are tired because he's the direct runner, he's fast, and he can the way he can hit the ball on the run before a, sl- a tired defender is going to have a chance to get anywhere near him. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, I suppose like you, you think about the last big impact sub maybe, and we're not putting Shane Kingston as an impact sub. I'm just saying Neil Ronan, mm. like he used to do that for Cork. He didn't maybe yeah. like the like the tag of it, like, but he came on and he always made a difference and. Don Lo Grady, John Allen, like these guys, they would have kept him in reserve for that reason that he would have ma- made an impact and defenders see him coming on, as you said, as the team gets loose. So, like, you know, it's it can only it's it, it is such a GA thing, you know, that it, one of the top intercounty teams in the manager are in the country, um, here in Cork, Kieran Kingston's the manager, and his son is one of the main forwards, like and the as you said, we're often hardest on our own, you know. Um especially in club scenes we see it you know all the time that i suppose there's a great was saying is that no matter who's going bad take off the car forward and maybe sometimes that's the that's the manager's son and you know they, they can be hardest on their own but i think shane kingston showed a great level of maturity in his interview after the match yeah. you know he could have went on and said this that and the other but i think that's i think that's the way in county lads are nowadays they're very very good um, media wise you know but he just said look i wasn't going well 
I didn't deserve my start. Hopefully I'll get to start the next day. But I think that's that, that's what you need in any group. You need to understand that, look, if you don't start, you are coming on and understand that when the team wins, everybody wins and you will be a massive part of that. And if you can get that into a culture, it's unbelievable. I don't know, Mick, have you watched that Chase in the Sun documentary about the South African team and the culture that they had there in the World Cup like that? Razzy was trying, to, Razzy Rasmus trying to talk to the guys who know they won't be talking out. So their jobs were to go away and see what see what way the referees were refereeing the game, see what way the malls are setting up. Now I'm not a massive rugby fan, but I just thought, like, imagine having that kind of culture that that in GA terms that the guys who aren't going to make the 26 have mm. jobs to say, right, I'm going to pretend I'm going to play this training match like someone you could mark the next day, or I'm going to go in and do um find out information on their puckouts for for the backs or for the forwards and. The culture that, yeah, you, you, won't, you won't get any credit outside, but by God, you'll get some credit inside. Like, you know, and I think I think Limerick have it. I think Limerick have it in abundance in their culture and the way they are on and off the field. They're very close. And I think this Cork group are very close. And I think Shane Kingston epitomized that the other day. And he, he could have said a lot of things, you know, I scored seven points, I should be playing. He said, no, I wasn't going well. I didn't deserve my start. Kieran Kingston, you know, laughed it off after the game, said, oh, I told you I had to drop you to try and get you going again. So... But look, I mean, I think it's a great headache for, for Kieran yeah. Kingston and the boys to have to, over the next couple of weeks um, to see yeah. what way are they going to start, but more importantly, Mick, what way are they going to finish the other and final? Like. But you need, like, you need eight or nine forwards that you could start without without uh, without having to worry about them if you're going to win all Ireland, don't you? Like, that's just a fact these days, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a given, yeah. yeah, it's a given that if any of them went down, you know, injury, warm-up, first yeah. 10 minutes, then you look over straight away, you know, exactly who's coming on. I think Limerick have that, like, you know, Limerick yeah. have that in Pat Ryan. If one of the inside forwards goes down, Pat Ryan, no issue at all. Graham Mulcahy can do it as well. You know, younger guys then, like Cahal O'Neill, you know, might be might be a bridge too far for him, maybe yeah. an all in a final. But, David Reedy. Yeah, you know, David Reedy, you're looking at other guys here, like, that are, that are burning up, I'm sure, like, I mean, in, in defence. If it's not happening for one of the boys, sure, look, we'll bring on Richie English, like, you know. I yeah. Mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The reason I, asked... I think I think Cork have good, good, good backup now. Alan Connolly um, did it the last, uh, yeah. has done it every time he's come on. He's he's a worry now, you know, he, he, he takes mind and so he does, you know. And and in defence then, if it's not happening for, for if it's not happening for Niall O'Leary or it's not happening for Sean O'Donoghue, you know, Sean O'Leary Hayes can come on and it doesn't upset the apple cart too much. So I think they, I think they've good, I think both squads have good, good cover for, for each line of the field, like. Absolutely, absolutely. I think Colin Spillane is back as well, isn't he? For yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I asked about the forwards though because I, I, we'll talk more about Cork when we talk about the final in a few minutes, and I want to talk about the other match. But Kilkenny, there's a couple of things I want to talk about with Kilkenny. But one of those things is the forwards. I talked about. I talked up that forward line with you last week, and you know they are there. I just wonder. I don't know. Like John Donnelly doesn't have a good game. Um, Keown doesn't have a good game when he comes on and taken off again. Uh, you know, Mullen scored a brilliant one too and was there for them when it mattered, but maybe over the 90 minutes didn't have his best game. And it's just like, I don't know if, if Kilkenny, if maybe that's where they're falling a little bit short is when the guys that Cody needs to rely on aren't firing. There isn't that, there isn't that nine, there isn't that, you know, uh, seventh, eighth and ninth forward to come on and, and save the day really. Yeah. Like I know, I know, I know what you're saying, Mick. Like, I mean, if I suppose if we use the top team at the moment, if Hegarty doesn't have his best day, yeah, it's okay. Keen Lynch and Tom Morrissey might chip in and vice versa. I suppose TJ didn't have his his greatest day from open play yesterday. There still did so many good things and mm. was involved in, in an awful lot of things. But as you're saying, just maybe didn't have that other marquee forward that, that put his hand up to say, I'm actually going to take it on. Now, to be fair to Billy Ryan, I suppose. He played well. he five points from play yesterday, yeah. and I thought Downey had a massive game. But Billy Ryan, for a lot of that game, gave him gave him a lot of trouble, and he he did put his hand up, you know. But as you said, Adrian Mullen, yeah, it didn't have his best game. Still, I think it came away one three, like you know. So, but like you know, it just doesn't have that that character, like you know, that 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 massive that figure, like like that another another TJ, like you know, like like they used to have, I suppose, in the years gone by. That if it wasn't happening for Shefflin, that's okay. On Larkin, will do it for you. If it's not happened for the two of them, that's all right. You know, maybe Taggy might pop up with three or four pints or Eddie Brennan or, or the great Richie Power or, or look, it goes on and on and on, like the, the, the talent that they had. And maybe they, maybe just don't have that 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 talent at the moment, but they are a very, very good group. And I suppose they are very, very young with the exception of of, of maybe TJ and Wally Walsh and Richie Hogan coming on, you know. 
Killian Buckley has given great service as well. No, I'm not saying any of them are going to walk away, but like you know, it's it's probably it's 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 a new team now. Like you know, it's 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 own Cody's team now. It's James Maher's team now. It's it's Michael Carey's team now. It's it's Hugh Lawler's team now. You know, and Owen Murphy, obviously, this unbelievable goalkeeper that he is. But yeah, I I get what you're saying, and I suppose is is it a worry for Kilkenny? I don't think it is a worry. I think there'll always be great talent in Kilkenny, but they just maybe need to maybe another year now for for own Cody like and Billy Ryan that the confidence he'll get from this might might you know might might make them make the next step up and I suppose people a lot of people are asking like is, is TJ done now like I don't think he is done personally I think with the job he's in with the gym I think he'll know how to mind himself and get the body right to give it a, another good go next year you know time waits for no man and I think TJ 33 this year maybe might be turning 34 but I think he's still in great shape and I think he really want to give it one one more good go and and and, and try and get back into an Ireland final for for himself anyway as well and obviously for for the whole panel but yeah I suppose they just don't have the same same array of talent or or or, or you know yeah. unbelievable players they had in years gone by but still still a good group mate I'd say like yeah still a very good team like Leinster champions like extra time in all Ireland semi final you can't complain too much but I have some there's a comment here saying is it, is it time for Cody to go has he dragged the standard of Leinster into the mire which I think is a bit unfair but that's fine um I understand I like the, is time is Cody is it time for Cody to go I think is a genuine question and here's why right this is just since some stats since 1904 when Kilkenny won their first all Ireland they've never gone 10 years without winning all Ireland they went nine a couple of times they've gone eight a couple of times seven a couple of times six years now since from 2016 to 2021 without winning all ireland which is the same length as 94 to 99 which we remember it was eight years between 84 and um or 74 and 81 uh you know these are kind of this is full-on drought level in kilkenny even by historic standards we talk about like you know this it'll never happen again the great team of uh you know the mid 2000s and stuff but Kilkenny always win all Ireland's you know what I mean six years is genuinely a drought now like you know what I mean next year will be their seventh year yeah, I, I'm not really, really. this doesn't have to be a Cody conversation but I'm just wondering like it doesn't feel like they're, they're getting younger these lads are getting more experienced but if T, you take TJ Reid out of that team you take Park Walsh out of that team you take Owen Murphy out of that team and you're thinking like they're still the three linchpins really yeah I, like I look, I, I hate going back, right? But like, say if, if ten years ago, uh, probably ten, twelve or thirteen of their team would have made most teams in the country. I think it'd be fair yeah. enough to say that. Like, whereas now, uh, who who would make every team in the country or most teams? You know, Owen Murphy would make a majority of them. TJ Reid would make a majority of them. Parish Welch would make a majority of them. After that, you just you know you just don't you you couldn't see them being absolute guaranteed starters on on on. On the rest of the teams and i think that's that's the difference as well uh is it time for cody to go i think one of the well, as i said to someone the other day one of the perks of greatness is that you go when you want to go um so i think brian cody will will definitely not be pushed out by the kenny county board no way Never they, they just have too much respect for him for what he's done for Kil, for kilkenny and for hurling down there and i think he'll go when he feels the time is right to go i i feel personally that 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 Brian has maybe found the whole COVID thing hard. You know, he's he's one of the few inter-county managers. He, he always leaves his mask on, mask on on the sideline, whether that's him just personally, he wants to do everything right. But, you know, he's, I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure what age Brian Cody is, but he, he has become a frailer man, if that, if that makes sense, you know, on, uh, in, in, in the last couple of years, you know, it's, it's all affected us in some ways, one way or another, this COVID thing. But uh, Brian Cody is, he, for me, he's, he, he's not the same presence on the sideline as, as what he used to be. You know, who am I to judge Brian Cody? I'm absolutely no one. And Brian Cody doesn't give two continentals what I think about him as a manager, and rightly so. But I'm just giving my opinion in that he's not the same presence on the sideline as what he was maybe a few years ago, you know, when you see that energy with him. And, he, you know, it's it's just it's just not the same. It's just not the same. And, like, I just don't – I still I still don't feel that – that Kilkenny will be asking him to leave Dominic. I think that he'll he'll leave on his own terms, and I think Kilkenny will will understand that as well. But as you said, six years it's a mini famine um, down there. Like, could you could you see them pushing on, maybe doing something big next year? At the moment, you probably couldn't because with the question marks over a couple of the greats, like you know, like Richie Hogan. I I I I, I think Richie will, be, will find it hard to go back next year with the injuries he's had and the very li the little amount of game time he's got this year. You know, um. But as I said, TJ, that's that's a big one for them, you know. Um, no more so than Joe Cannon stepping away from Galway. If TJ steps away, 
it just takes away that kind of aura, you know, that kind of that kind of real touch of class when when we needed most up there, like you know. But I don't look. It'll it, it'll allow others to step up, you know, no more so than his belly hail teammates, Adrian Mullen and Owen Cody. But uh, to answer the question, is it time to Cody for Cody to go? Uh, in my opinion, I can't call that. I think it'll be totally up to him whether 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 he's there or not next year, Mick. I won't read out John's comment here, but TJ Reid is not overrated. He did score from play yesterday, and you try scoring 10 plus games, uh, points a uh, game from freeze uh, in Go Park in a dollar semi final. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on to the other match, right? Because uh, hey or no hey, uh, eventually uh, we got to play the game on Saturday. Uh, you made it for a throw in, did you? Yeah, Bailgate. Bailgate, they were calling it there on the way up. Uh, well, I was, I was corrected by Mark Farrelly, uh, with, uh, him of a farming background and formerly of Balls.e. Uh, he said that it was nothing to do with uh, hay. It was, in fact, straw, but we needn't get into the difference. <laughs> I I, uh, to me, straw and hay, I don't know, but uh, Bailgate, uh, and we made it. How big a deal is it to delay a game by half an hour if you're, like, Limerick and Waterford all are the semi-finalists and you're coming up to Dublin and you're eating at a certain time and so on because Joanne Cantwell was saying on TV that both elected to try and play to, get to, to start the game on time despite yeah. the fans being in and the GA eventually made the call yeah and I okay I, I know if you've seen that see Darrow Donovan's interview after the match and Darrow Donovan you know uh, I'm delighted to see someone like Darrow Donovan get get man of the match for just pure honesty work rate and what he did leak mm. in the play it might not always be top scorer but what he did but what he was saying was that they should have started the match because both teams wanted to start the match. And I and I and I get that. I, I've been involved in games where it, there has been a delay for traffic or for whatever reason. And I suppose when you're in that bubble of the team and the panel and the and the management and you just want your focus on five o'clock and now it's gone to half five, you just can't understand why that's not fair. Now I'm just gonna flip that around and say for someone who's actually sitting very, very close to the bridge when the when the bail when bailgate happened. <laughs> the, the, the anxiety of the fans like and the amount of fans yeah. and we were well up the road when it happened the anxiety of it to say you mightn't get a chance to see your county play and maybe you mightn't get a chance to see your county play again this year and who knows what's going to happen next year up yeah. in Pro Park so I I think when you're in the bubble of the team you think that's all that matters and you just want to play the game and that's fair enough but I suppose we have to look at the bigger picture here in that it's all about the fans like you know i mean the fans create the atmosphere they're there supporting the teams and all that and a lot a lot of people would have missed a lot of that match and i would say mick even some people might have turned around and went home they couldn't just take it anymore and mm. sitting in the traffic and knowing what time they would have got up to crow park so i think the right thing was done for the for yeah. for people to get in and take their time and not be rushing up the road and maybe cause another accident trying to get in before uh for five o'clock it was put back a half an hour did it affect the game I, I don't know. It, 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 it might have been some small fact, but I just think the intensity and the hits of the first quarter was a massive thing. Now, I know it was mentioned it was only four points to three after the first quarter, but I mean, a, a lot of that was down to the intensity at which the first yeah. quarter was played at. And, and Watford, they just threw everything, everything they had in the tank, they threw it at, at the Limerick boys. Something like what Kilkenny tried to do in, what Kenny did do in 2019, they threw everything at them in the first half. But Kilkenny were, I think, nine points up after it, whereas Watford were a pint down. They were after hitting six wides. And and for me, when that when that was happening, you know, when they, they, they had given everything, you know, and I was there watching it, and even going in for the first water break, they just, they looked a little bit tired. You know, it was four games in 21 days. I think it's been well documented now as well. So when you're, when you're going in after giving everything, Mick, and you're still a pint down, it's, it's demoralizing. Like, you know, it is demoralizing. And I just think Limerick, took full advantage of that in the second quarter, outscored um, outscored the Watford lads 11 points to four in the second quarter then because they said, right, lads, Paul Knorr got him in. By yeah. the way, water breaks have to go, in my opinion. I think yeah. they're I think they're they're ridiculous at this stage. Knorr got him in and said, right, that's everything they have, lads. Let's go on her now. And they did. And I said, outscored them 11-4. And then it's 15, 15, seven and a half time. And to be honest, up there, it's it was kind of inevitable what, is, what was going to happen then after that. Like, like it's the same chance for everyone, but the water break, that, that's literally what I was going to say next, is like, the writing was on the wall, it's inevitable as you just said, it was, as, as soon as that, that water break came, you're thinking, Waterford can't do this anymore, Limerick will figure it out, and eventually they put in so much effort that it's almost like the, the opening gambit has failed, and you kind of felt it was inevitable Limerick were going to win the match from there, weirdly enough with a point gone, Limerick shouldn't have the chance to do that. 
they shouldn't have the chance to stop that water from momentum and they shouldn't have the chance to coach in the middle of the match either. Like, I know it's the same for everyone. What's the point? Of, why aren't the GA making this call mid-season when people are sharing water bottles all over the pitch? There's 70 examples on Twitter from Crow Park over the two days of people throwing water bottles onto other players or, or drinking them or passing them on or Horgan taking a sup before he took a free and so on and so forth. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not for him, Mick. You know, as no, a 37, no. as a 37, 37 year old playing club hurling, I don't mind him, to be honest. No. I mean, and you're getting all great. Oh, as, 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 as watching the yeah, games yeah. and watching the levels of fitness these lads have. I think the water breaks now, they're just pointers. I've used the one before, handbrake in a canoe. Uh, like there is, there is useful now as a waterproof tea bag. I tell you, that's, that, that's another one for you there, right? I mean, there is no water being drank at them. And if there is, very, very little. I have a three-year-old son, and I'd say he would drink more water in the water break than the boys are drinking. They just, they don't need it, like, really. I mean, there's people running marathons for three hours, and they just take an old slug of water every now and again. These lads are top athletes. Whether they get a they get a water break after 15, 16 minutes, they don't need it. They'll go in and refuel at half time anyway. I think, um, I think it takes the momentum out of the game. It sucks a bit of life out of the game. It's another stoppage we don't really need, and I don't think the players really need, and I think 100% the fans don't want to see it anymore. So if obviously they're, they are going to be kept for the All Ireland final, but if if Anton comes out of this, is that next year, just no more water breaks, please, because as you said, there's bottles of water being flung in everywhere anyway. If if you know if if someone really needs a drink that badly, which science would prove that they actually don't really need a drink that badly for the for the time they're on the pitch, and um, you know they'll they'll get it into them or whatever for whatever yeah. reason. But uh, also make another thing I keep that keeps cropping up this year. I don't know if you notice it is. When a, for a player going down to take a sting out of the game, I don't know is a coincidence or not, and I don't think it is. Everybody seems to have trouble with their contact lenses. So the <laughs> contact lens is like the water break of stoppages if something is needed. You watch it now in most games. Someone will go down, and it it will be a contact lens issue or a head issue. And what can the referee do? It has to stop the game if if, if yeah. it's something to do with the head. So I think that's something that's kind of crept into our game as well. Uh, if the team gets a run in your three or four points suddenly, magically, someone goes down. Because I don't think refs are buying the hamstring thing anymore. But if you yeah. go down and you say, oh, it's open in the eye here, contact lens, suddenly. I say, this lad's not even wearing contact lenses going down and they have problems with contact lenses. But yeah, water breaks, please get rid of them. And uh, check who, who wears glasses before the matches if they actually have contact lenses. Or well, you know. well, I don't have time to go off on this tangent. Either, but it, the, every decision has a consequence. And the GEA don't want to look amateurish by having trainers out on the field or Marishkas or anything like that while the game is going on. But if you just, if referee just let, allowed the trainer come on, fix the contact lens, you can play around someone. It's a bigger old pitch. Like, do you know what I mean? But no, say, has consequences. Like, get it started to come back on, you know? But people are going to take advantage of uh, of these decisions, you know, when they come in. So, oh, for God's sake. We could, we, we'll could we we'll spend the winter fixing this game, Shane, if it kills us. Um <laughs> But I don't know. What, I don't know if anybody's going to spend the winter coming up with a, uh, a plan to beat Limerick. Cork will spend the next two weeks trying. I, I, I was talking about perceived possible tiny percentage chance chinks in the armor last week. If they were there, Waterford didn't show them um, in, in in terms of attacking. I don't know if playing five forwards is the way against them. But then again, I don't know what the way is against them because the more I watch this team, the more I think I don't know if I've ever seen a team like them. When you watch the Kilkenny team that you guys beat in 2010 and probably should have beaten in 2009 and you you had amazing battles with the league and it's like that, this is a brilliant tip team as well. But, you know, there was a sense that there was, a, if you caught Kilkenny on the right day and you played to your absolute best, it was going to be a good game. You know what I mean? It was going to be yeah. a 50-50 chance, whatever. I don't know if, Kilkenny, if Limerick play at their best, I don't know if anybody can beat them at all, like under any circumstances. Yeah, I agree with you. I think if, if you go back to the Kenny teams, I suppose there, it was, there was less tactics and there was more kind yeah. of, they, they, they were just such good primary possession winners that when it went down 50-50, 19 out of 10, they were going to win it and they were going to work a score anyway because such was the quality of hurler that they were. I think, you know, tactically, Limerick are, you know, they're just way ahead, like, you know, be, and, and okay, let's touch on it there. Watford had Shane Bennett sitting in the pocket or sitting as a sweeper as best as they can, but I think it was well documented there when Limerick get the ball, they will not hit the ball or the person who is under pressure with the ball will not strike that ball under pressure. No way, no how. They'll work their little triangles. They have to go back 20 yards, they'll go back 20 yards and if they have to do two two or three hand passes, they will to get the likes of Dermot Burns or Kyle Hayes or Dickie Hannon, that Tom Brady-esque 
you know, vision he has to, to, to just nullify the sweeper. And it's so frustrating because they're so good at it. Like, they'll never strike the ball. You'll never see him running back towards their own goal, striking the ball over their shoulders, hoping it's going somewhere. That won't happen with this Limerick team. They'll, they'll work it and work it and work it. They'll get it to someone, right, you have a good vision, take out the sweeper, hit Flanagan, hit Galan, hit Casey, hit the space in front of him, don't put the ball down on top of the sweeper. Okay, so then you say, right, we won't bother playing a sweeper, let's. Fine, that's perfect. Now you've left loads of space and maybe behind your half-back line, or maybe we can shoot from distance. They're, like Limerick's half-forward line scored nine points from play the other day, compared mm. to Watford's half-forward line scored one point from play. So no matter what way you want to play with them, they don't mind, like. They'll play it either way. If you want to play a sweeper, fine. And Carr probably will go with Mark Coleman back there. And but they'll just try and find the pockets either side of either side of him. And they'll and they'll just cut it and, and they'll just give a quality, quality ball into Flanagan. If I know, um, by the way, I think I think Flanagan is a front runner for Hurler Deer at the moment as well. Yeah. I said this yeah. last night and people disagreed with me. I said, look at him, look at him over the games, look at him against Tip. I think he popped up at one, three, one, four, four pints from play yesterday. Could have had six pints. But he is winning so much ball. He doesn't mind how the ball goes in. But the ball, mm. when the ball goes in well to him, he gets it and he just has this way of looping around off the left over the shoulder. So I think Limerick having an abundance. I think John Kiley was saying with so many improvements to make and I was just there, oh, Jesus Christ, what are the rest of us doing if he has so many improvements to make? He said, oh, our work rate can up. So I, I, I thought about that on the way home in the car. I said, our, up rate, our work rate can up. And I was looking over the game and looking over things again. They scored 115 from either turning over the Watford or winning their puck outs and getting a score. 115. And he's on about their work rate. No. The only thing I can see that they can improve on, maybe, is their 14 whites. But if you don't shoot, you don't score. I know that's Canork's motto with them. If you don't, you have to shoot to score. They had 14 whites. You know, to be fair, they had four of them in the last quarter alone when the game was done and dusted and lads were just maybe taking on a few shots. But it's 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 frightening for the rest of us. I think I know you want to touch maybe touching the Peter Casey thing make quickly, but yeah. I think he's a massive loss. And okay. why do you think he's a massive loss? Uh, popped up with five pints from playing the Munster final. He had two pints got the other day. He's directly involved in that goal, and he's everything good uh, about Limerick. He's involved in an awful lot of it. Mm. He's a deceiving player. He's strong on the ball. He does the right thing with the ball. He takes mind in. So I think he's a massive, massive loss to Limerick. And I, I, I can't if they want to appeal, they can. But I can't see him getting off the card. There was movement to the head mix. So, but I think he's going to be a huge loss. That might be might give Cork some hope, you know, as in how to set up the next day comes back to earlier though doesn't it when it's like you know if you've got someone who might not be in the best form but someone as good as Graham Mulcahy to come in or someone like Pat Ryan who's been waiting in the wings for a chance for a long time really yeah. from the start that like you know may, may, again might not do all the things that, that, that Casey does and there's a reason he's there every week but um, is there do you have any do you give any uh, credence to the sort of argument that they're robotic or boring uh, no, I, I wouldn't know. I think right. I think they're I think I think they're some hurlers. Like I they they are they, they might look to some some people outsiders to say, Oh, this is so boring. It's so boring because they're so good. Like I mean, if you like you compare it to other sports, right? Compare it to Barcelona at their pump, you'll just be watching them passing the ball, passing the ball, passing the ball, like, oh, so boring. How many passes are they have they have to get? But sure, they have to be so controlled and trust the system so much. And you have to at the end of the day, you have to have the players to do it. Like Limerick. Limerick have the players to annoy you so much in a 10, 15 yard space. Just just bang, 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 ball to hand, hand pass, stick pass. Now someone's in the best position. Now get the ball into Flanagan and we'll get a score out of it. Reset. Well, let's reset for their puck outs. They, it, everyone knows where exactly they need to be. They're playing with each other so long. They trust the system. But at the end of the day, do you know what I mean? You you could try this system maybe with, with, with the Leitrim hurlers or someone like that with all due respect to them. But I mean, they'll try and they'll work hard and everything. But Limerick just have a bunch of players at the moment. And I'm always saying to Limerick people, and I think they understand as well, this is the greatest hurling team they've ever had, maybe the greatest hurling team they ever will have. And they are going, they're trying to get to every game to see as much as them as what yeah. the genuine Limerick fans are saying, because we know this might come again for a long time. And I think that's the difference. People say it's robotic, it's boring. No, I just think they're so good. They're making it look so easy. And they're making the rest of us play, play catch up at the moment, Mick. Yeah, and let's not forget, Shane, that if you're not from one of the traditional counties, you're only allowed to be good for so long before everyone turns in you as well. That's uh, well, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's it. it. <laughs> or the higher powers come against you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cork are back now, yeah. So maybe, maybe we want to see Cork lift and Lee McCarthy again. Maybe it's been too long. Have they got a like we're talking? I, I actually am looking forward to re watching the Munster semi final in the next couple of weeks just to sort of see what we can get out of that because Limerick did get two goals 
in a very short period of time um that sort of but they, they always did hold them off and we didn't think limerick were incredible that day but as you said last week they won by eight points cork feel like a different team now as well though oh, oh god yeah like i mean if you look when you when you look back at that much semi final, this is what you're going to see right two completely different teams i think right and also yeah. not to like i don't think peter casey thought to hurley but he got sin bin that day so <laughs> unfortunately it's not been a good year for him and um, discipline wise you know but if you think about it right um hoggy didn't score from play that day Okay, 15 points yesterday, six points from play. Missed freeze as well that day, weird. Yeah, like, he missed yeah. freeze and everything. Didn't score in the yeah. last quarter of the game that day. Um, let's go look at Limerick that day. Tom Morrissey, no score from play. Aaron Galan, no score from play. Like, look at Tom Morrissey did at the weekend, five points from play. Galan scores one, five, one, one from play. Like, the thing, like, the, I think it's two different teams now uh, in the confidence that they're playing in. Um, and the way the group is set up, um, obviously Limerick don't change too much. I mean, exact same team started Saturday. Bar Peter Casey is in for Graham Mulcahy. I started all in the final last year. Cork, Cork are, you know, Cork are a new team. We, you, you, you can see that from, uh, I think you said six out of the 15 would have played the 2019 quarterfinal. So they're, they're a new group coming through. But I just think, like, where where can Cork take hope from, from the performance they had that day, I suppose? If Pat Horgan had scored the penalty, you know, mm-hmm. uh, at the time the score was one five six points, but then Limerick outscore him two four to two points with fourteen men. Yeah. Um so the ifs and buts. Um, I thought I thought Cork's backs were really good that day. Did a great job on Tom Morrissey. Sean O'Donoghue did an outstanding job on Aaron Galan, front runner for an All Star. I'd say Sean O'Donoghue. Uh, and the other thing was their puckouts and the way the the way Cork's puckouts have been going, they're forcing other teams. To go to take on puckouts that they don't really want to take on, and I think that was very evident against Kilkenny. I just have one stat for you here, Mick. You know, um, that in the second half, Kilkenny went, went along with 17 puckouts and they only won five. So, I think you have a really good Cork defense and you have forwards buzzing around the place. And as you said, seven or eight forwards now that can that can start the game or finish the game. So, I think they'll take they'll take great confidence from that the way the way they've um, progressed since and the questions that they've answered since but i just think that limerick are getting better and better i thought they were really good saturday um i'd say someone was getting ready to play the cranberries from about the 50th or 52nd minute they knew what was going to happen and i just think like, is the ultimate is the ultimate performance coming again in the final like they did last year okay yeah. peter casey will be out but as you said and they're dead right nick like imagine if pat ryan got a start on the final imagine what he could do and chomping at the bit and point to prove so the strength and depth that they have the culture they have and the group of players they have at the moment, they just look unbeatable. They really do. Like, Yeah, there was been a feeling, I, I don't know if I said it earlier in the year or not, that like it, it feels like might might be one of those championships where all the storylines are in the battle to face Limerick, but that the, the Limerick procession might have been inevitable from the start and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And sure, if that's the case, that's a team that people can celebrate and enjoy in their own way as well, but it might not leave us at the most entertaining point. But I do think... I don't know how many people were getting in Crow Park, Shane, but if it's 60,000 or something close to that, maybe, I don't know, but um, I could be wrong about that, maybe 50. Um, but, you know, I think it'll be, uh, the, the Cork crowd will definitely add to the occasion anyway. I was say, saying to you before we came on air, there was a sense of, uh, I saw one of them hitting one of their friends when Cork got a point yesterday. I was thinking, I've been at this bloody match against them a million times. And it's like, when you're the other fan, it's not very fun being at a Cork match, but as a neutral watching it, they bring unbelievable colour to the games. And it is actually great that they're in the All-Ireland final, despite all my complaining about them <laughs> being back there. You know, oh, yeah. Them to be there at least once a decade, I think, is fair enough. Something that we can handle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's it. I think it's I think it's 40,000, Mick, isn't it? 40, that's going to be in the final. Yeah, yeah, just confirmed there. So, uh, but look, I, you're dead right. I think the Cork crowd... You, you you have to love them. You 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 maybe love to hate them or you, you or anything, but I think they're they're great characters. They bring great color around the place, and I just think it will be a more exciting final because of it, and um, because of them being in it, because of the color that they'll bring, because of the buzz that they'll bring, and the car crowd are a great crowd to follow. But I tell you what, even when Limerick weren't going great, they have a great crowd following them as well, and they yeah. they always have massive massive support of the game. So forty thousand tickets, you know, they'll be like. They like hen's teeth, as they say. They'll be very hard got um, over the next couple of weeks. But look, isn't it great for your counties to be in it? And hopefully, both both sets, uh, both sets supporters can really enjoy the next couple of weeks now and uh, and the build up to it. Like, yeah, definitely. Um, look, can't wait to, to talk about it. Can't wait to watch it. I've never, I, we never talked about um, about Waterford and uh, the cattle and 
you know, their fans have been spectacular as well. And I, I saw them getting very excited during that first quarter, like you said. But it's been a really, really good year for them. It's been a really, really good two years for them. Do you see that as a project that can continue to kind of make a step up? It's obviously a very young team. Waterford, you always have this fear a little bit that <laughs> I've mentioned it a few times that they could just uh, implode at any point and start the bricks again. And then in, in a weird way, like incredible consistency over the last two decades or whatever, but it does seem like there's a, there's kind of low points along the way as well. Yeah, there is. I think, I I, I hope that Liam Cahill would maybe stay on. Obviously, there's there's talks of the, the tip job being, a, yeah. being, being an option and coming up, but who, who knows about that? I think Liam Sheedy will be, will be the man to decide that if he steps away or not himself. But I think I, I'd like to see Liam Cahill stay on with Watford. I think, like like we said already, we've used the word culture. I think he's created a, a great culture down there with the Watford lads. You know, next year he'd have maybe Ty De Burka back, Park Manny might be back, maybe Stephen O'Keefe will come back. I mean, there's three massive guys to throw in and look at the wealth of experience that they got this year. They're very, very close to the team. Um, they're just coming up against one of the, you know, one of, as I said, one of the greatest hurling teams of the modern era. Like, you know, but like, you know, I think... I think there's a great group down there and I think for someone else to come in now they might find it hard like to try and instill the same kind of culture and belief that Liam Cahill and Mikey Beadmans and the management team in Watford ha- have done down there you know the, the physical shape that they're in and the belief that they have in the group I'm, I'm sure as well you know with with the current management and you know it's 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 very very hard to keep chopping and changing managements all the time because it does take managements a year or two to bid in I mean look at it like we go back to it again look at Limerick like I mean, it wasn't all a bit of roses the, for, for John Kiley's first year in 2017. They went down to play Kilkenny in a qualifier game down Nolan Park, a game they could have won, but they didn't. And there was obviously questions being asked about, about, about them as well. But yeah. it takes a management, it takes management team a while to go in and for the group to buy into their, you know, into their values and into what they believe the group should be doing. So for for Watford's sake, and I, I, I would hope that Liam Cahill and the lads would stay on, give it another year, try and get a few more of the you know more experienced guys back from injury and the experience that the younger lads have got this year and i honestly do feel that there will be there will be a force again next year you know and maybe success you know is maybe bringing back a monster title to watford and pushing on and trying to get back into an all-around final again but i i i do think that there's been great great things done down there in the last couple of years under under lean cal's guidance mate all right well listen we've lots more to talk about before the before the final but uh shane thanks a million for today it was a great weekend and uh the all Ireland hurling semi-finals weekend has definitely i think established itself as one of the best uh weekends of the year now in the irish sporting calendar but uh unfortunately we have to go and talk to darren about football infiltrating infiltrating the final weekend now possibly uh if the Tyrone kerry game gets suspended but uh we'll see how that goes yeah. um but thanks a million for joining us today cheers mate thanks a million